well, what a privilege it is to be here. And thank you for the, uh, thank you, Brandy's advertising, a good advert there. Thank you. What a great opportunity we have to share God's word today and be in his presence. So today, um, I felt prompted to share something which is an extension of what Adam shared three weeks ago. In fact, he shared on the 2nd of July. Was anyone here for Adam's sermon? Yep. Yeah. Wasn't a great sermon. And he spoke about God's image and who God is because he's a good God. Yeah. And one of the things that he said, I, I wrote notes for, for just, just so that I could get the right context. I always like writing notes. For those that do that, it's a great way to remember. Mm-hmm. One of the things he said was that how do, he, he asked us a question. He said, how do we reflect the character of God. How do we reflect it? Because character is built upon, upon our life's ex- expectations, belief systems. So how do we reflect God's image? And what sort of image of God do we reflect? He also said that Jesus is, per- is the perfect embodiment of God's image in human form. We get to know God through God the Father, through Jesus and what he did on earth. That's what I wrote and learnt from uh, that, that sermon. So what am I talking about today? Well, God, the first thing was that I went up to Adam and said, you stole my sermon. <laughs> but God said to me, he said, no, no, I haven't finished with that sermon. I haven't finished with that message yet because God is a good God. He's a wonderful Father and he's a God of great character. Now, we don't get to have great character ourselves unless we associate with people that have great character and we learn from their character. Yeah? Yeah. God's character is worthy of learning from and being part of. The closer we are to him, the less of our earthly carnal character exists and more of his character can come forward because he's a good father. He's a great father. My wife, Megan, she's not in... She's out at Kids Church at the moment, but she's... she's, um, basically a chaplain these days at a, at a local school and she's teaching these kids and introducing these kids to God for the first time and I heard a story that came back from the year ones where there's a little girl called Lily and Megan had done her sessions and then the classroom teacher had taken over and uh, um, and then this Lily was just he grabbed a piece of paper and she was madly drawing and writing and drawing and the teacher come up to her and said um she said, what are you doing, Lily? And she said, I'm drawing God and God's face. And the teacher said, well, no one has seen or know what God looks like. How could you be doing that? And she said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> Amen. So, so kids can have a, an amazing perspective on God. So today I, I wanted to share with you a little bit more of an extension on what Adam was sharing a few weeks ago about God's character, about who he is. And why that matters to us. Now, am I going, which one am I? Here we go. Has anyone seen that image before? Yeah. Yep. That image was created by a, a little girl called Arcane, and from the United States. At the age of three, she started seeing images and visions of God. Now, what's unique about her story is she comes from an atheistic family completely atheistic so had no concept of who God was in the family the father was previously brought up as a Catholic he was a chef and come out from Chicago to Illinois and they're living in a country area they didn't have any technology they were very poor the the parents were very isolated and didn't didn't congregate very much in the community but at the age of three she started having visions by the age of six she drew that she painted that picture just like that and she believed that that was an image of Jesus. That was her story. I'm not sure. I haven't seen Jesus quite like that before. But has anyone seen the, the movie, um, um, that the movie, that little boy that died and went to heaven? Heaven can wait. What was it called? Heaven's for real. Heaven's for real. And Colton was his name, Colton. Well, Colton teamed up with this, this young, young girl and he believed that the eyes of Jesus depicted there were very similar to the image of Jesus that he saw when he ascended to heaven. My point in bringing that out now is that if we understand more of God and who he is and what he looks like and what his character's like, 
it helps us to really focus on him. Does anyone remember that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? Yeah. Well, I've got to tell you, often when I'm highly stressed, and that happens from time to time, the thing that I focus on is God, is Jesus, and his creation. Because it helps me forget about my problems and focus on him, because he is eternal. And he's bigger than anything that I could be facing at any point in time, because he's a good, good father. So today, I just want to share with you what God put on my heart about his character and his nature and what I think he wants to share with us. So who is God? Well, the first thing about God is that he is our creator. Now, in this modern world of intellectualism and science and all these things, we try to justify the non-existence of God. It's incredible the links we go to with carbon dating and all these scientific phenomena to be able to try and prove that we just happened with a big bang. You know, I, I find it incredible that first there was nothing and then nothing exploded and then life came. It's, it's just unreal. I mean, you need a lot of faith to believe in that stuff. It's just terrific, isn't it? So, but, but, but of course, we, 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 we live in, in, a, in four dimensions of a created reality that God is commander in chief and ruler over. He's our God and our creator. And we are made in his image. It says so in Genesis. He says that God came and he created us in his image. That means you look a bit like God. And he looks a bit like you. We are created in his form and in his image. It's a good thing, really, if you think about it. When you get to heaven, it'd be great. It'd be pretty scary if he looked something completely different than human form, wouldn't it? Like an alien or a Martian or something like that. But he looks like you. In fact, he probably looks like a collage of all of us. You know, we are the body, embodiment of God, God's people. Um, and he looks like us. He related to us and he came to earth and he walked among us. And we're going to talk about that today. The other exciting thing about God is that he's beyond time. And he, beyond time because he created time. Now, that's really hard for human beings to get our minds around because we are bound, bookended by time. We're born and then in this world we die. Or our flesh does anyway. No one really dies. Our, hu our spirit form never dies, but our body does. doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. If you don't believe in God, you're never eternally going to die. But there are consequences for not choosing to believe in God. But you who believe in God, in a hundred years' time, guess where you're going to be? Where are you going to be? Heaven. Heaven. You're going to be with God. You're going to be in his reality, in his, his dimension. That's where you're going to be. And that's exciting. And he's a good father. So we have God, God portrays himself through the Bible in three, as three persons. The first person that we, we understand God to be is a good father. And that's God the father, Lord the father. And it's referred to as Lord. The second dimension of the, what we call the Trinity is the son. And that is who? It's Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He also refers to himself as the Son of Man to fulfill the prophecy in Daniel, which is very interesting. If you ever want to go down that hole, it's a very exciting silo to go down. And, but, but also, he created a lot of controversy when he was on earth by calling himself the Son of Man because the Pharisees and the, the Israelite uh, religious leaders did not like the fact that he was effectively saying that he was the Messiah and he was the chosen Son of God, and they did not like that. They really were offended by that. But then the third dimension of the, Holy, of, of, of the Trinity is Christos, which means the Holy Spirit. Now, we often use the words Lord Jesus Christ, which is the full dimension, the three dimensions of the Trinity. Lord Jesus Christ. So we often pray and we say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for his presence, we pray for his anointing, we pray for situations to be overturned and changed so God God is three but he is one he is one God and he expresses himself through the old and the new testament to help us understand who he is and so today we're going to explore who he is so the, the trinity refers to each other each of the each of the people persons of the trinity refers to each other um, refers to each other and the way they talk about each other just shows the, the character, and the, the personality of God. And there's a lot we can learn from the personality of God and the way we behave and the way we treat others. 
There's a lot can be learnt from that. The Trinity, all, all three persons of the Trinity in the Old and New Testament talk about and express these types of characters. Humility, serving and honouring. They're never lord over each other. It's never directive. It's always in a servant heart and a servant attitude. And that just, just gives you an idea, an inkling of the character and the, the personality of God. He's a serving God. He's a humble God. He's an honouring God. Very different to Satan and all that we learn about him and his personality. But God is a good God. So Jesus consistently honoured the Father. He did it consistently. And a lot to, I'm not going to give you all the scriptures today because we haven't got time for that. But he consistently honoured and served the Father. He, he did things that would please the Father and what's interesting also about Jesus is he did a lot of praying to the Father when he was in human form on earth. And you've got to question, why would he need to pray? But he did, and that's a whole different topic that I'd love to talk about someday, but I've been pondering. But Jesus prayed. And if he was if he, the Son of God, the incarnation of God the Father on earth, needed to pray, well, so much more should we, don't you think? Yeah. Absolutely. If he did, if it's good for him, it probably is good for us. So the, the father honoured the son and an example of that was when Jesus was baptised and the father spoke and there was a dove from heaven come and that was the Holy Spirit that came. But the father spoke from heaven and said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. He honoured the son in front of all those that were present. He put honour on, on the son. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus he always points to Jesus. Whenever the Holy Spirit appears and talks, it always points to Jesus, which is very interesting. Another, another attribute or aspect of God is that he was a suffering servant. Now, what's incredible about that is, why would God in all of his majesty, in all of his power, in all of his dominion and authority, come and serve us a lot? <laughs> Why would he bother doing that? And why would he do it so gracefully and so humbly? But he did. And we see some examples of that. One of the ones that blows my mind is the fact that Jesus, the son of the living God, the commander of heaven, Lord, Lord's heaven's armies. I mean, this is a big job he's got. This is the commander in chief. He could have commanded at any point when, when the Pharisees and the religious leaders tried to throw him off the cliff and did different things in the, in the New Testament that we read about. He could have commanded them immediately to be, be, be destroyed, just like that. But he didn't. He was there to serve. And he was there to serve the will of the Father, which is an incredible thing when you think about it. The humility that he had in serving. And there he was serving this motley crew of 12 disciples. I mean, they, were, they give us all hope. They really do. They are terrific. They give us all hope. I mean, Peter, he just couldn't put a foot right, except when it was in his mouth. That was the only thing he did properly at times. I mean, he just couldn't help himself. But gee, didn't God use him, eh? Gives us hope, I reckon. Gives me hope. If my mother was here, she could tell you some stories of me and some of the things I've said. Man, my father will see this sermon, I'm sure. And he could tell you some stories of things I've said sideways. But Peter, look what God did with Peter. So he did some amazing things. But here's Jesus, the commander-in-chief, the, the, the most beloved son of God, the living God. And he's there serving and washing the feet of these stinky disciples. What an incredible act of servanthood. And what did he say at the end of it? He said, he said to Peter, he said, if you don't let me wash your feet, um, you can't serve me and be with me. And then what, what did Peter say? Well, if that's the case, well, wash all of me. And you know the story. If you don't, that's a great story to read. But, 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 he, but, but Jesus said at that point, he said, go and do likewise. So in other words, it doesn't matter how big and important you think you are, because he was big and important, right? He could have commanded at any point an army that would blitz anything on earth to have come and supported him, but he chose to serve. And he said to all, the, all those disciples who became great leaders of him, he said, go and do likewise. In other words, go and serve. Go and serve at the bottom. It's not just about preaching to great crowds and speaking to great people and having the grand jobs and the heads of the tables. Go and serve. Get into the kitchens. Get into the byways and serve, because that's what Jesus did. 
Jesus was willing to suffer and be persecuted and beaten, hung on a cross, and to do the Father's will and human- will to redeem humanity. And he was willing to do that even before he come on earth and had to endure what he had to endure. And, and I can assure you that when you, when you, for example, are working in the garden shed and you hit your, hit your hand with a, uh, with a hammer and the pain that that causes both your physical body and ultimately your spirit as well, Jesus had the same pain when they nailed him to a cross. Okay, He was spirit like you are spirit and he was flesh like you are flesh. And so when they nailed him to a cross, he suffered just as much as you would have. But he did it and he was blameless and he did it for your salvation and for your future and mine too which is an incredible thing what a great great god he is the supremacy of god is is something i want to focus on because you just can't you can't overemphasize the supremacy of god you notice i've got pink i went to the barbie movie yesterday it was terrible It took me two hours on the John Deere after that just to get over it. I I needed immediate therapy. It was just, wasn't for me, I can tell you. Megan and Joshua loved it. They thought the humour, it was all over my head, I think. But anyway, that's another story. So I I, I just wanted to read read to you from, from a real Bible. It's a real Bible that my wife gave me, and I strongly recommend, if you really want to get into the Word of God, bring the Word with you. You can do it electronically, but the thing I love about this one is it's got all these, these notes at the bottom. Now, this is the idiot's guide to reading the Bible, because what it does is it shows you what all those important scriptures really mean in the context, and I just love it. I really love it. So thank you, Megan, for, for it's a bit tattered now. It's probably done 20 or 30 years, but it's been good. So the supremacy of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. There's a lot on that. There's a lot of in him all things hold together. You know, there's a lot of people on this earth that don't give God a credit, but the very life that we have in our bodies is powered by, the, by him and his creation. We don't respect and honour him enough for who he is and what he's given us and the life that he's given us. He's amazing. And he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, to dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, through Jesus' blood on a cross. cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind, Because of your evil behavior. Well, he's speaking to me there. I don't know about you, but he's speaking to me. By by now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through the death to to present you holy in the Father's sight, without blemish and and free of accusation. If you continue in your faith, established established and firm, not moved from the hope not move from the hope held out in the gospel. What, what I wanted to, to highlight here in the notes was that Jesus is not only equal to Jesus. Oh, the first point is that Jesus is equal to God the Father. That's the thing. There's, there's no hierarchical system that we understand between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are presented as equal. And that's important. That was particularly important to the Jews because the Jews... We saw the Messiah coming, but they didn't see him as being God and in, in, God in the same way we now understand him to be. It's so equal to God, as the image of the invisible God, he is the exact representation of God, which is quite amazing. So to think that Jesus is the exact representation of God, and he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says that to the disciples. You've seen me, you've seen the Father which is quite incredible. I was going to say when I started, and I, I didn't 
quite get to it. I'm not sure. Remind me tomorrow. Um, we, often, we often refer to the fact that I believe in something. I believe in God. I believe in Father Christmas. I believe in this and that and the other. It's, if you have a genuine faith and relationship with God, you don't believe in God. You believe in Jesus. You know him. I know Jesus. I believe in him. I believe in him, but I know him. And that, that's what makes my faith so secure, because I know him. And I know that when I meet him, it won't be like, oh, hello, you're not quite what I was thinking you'd look like. I'm going to know him. I'll, I'll feel his presence. I'll, it's just like his, the presence around me, I'll know him. And I, I really pray that that would be your experience with him too, because he wants to know you. And he wants to develop that relationship with you, that intimacy with you, that is so clear and so real. So I really challenge you today, if you don't feel that you know him, if, you believe, if you're coming along and you believe, but you don't know him yet, today is, your, is a great day to know him because he wants to know you. It's not, it's not a fake thing. It's not something I just believe and I get indoctrinated with. That's not it at all. It wouldn't work for me. When the tough times come, that wouldn't cut it. It's the fact that he's been there with me beside me, his arms around me, helping me, probably most of the time carrying me through those difficult times. They're the times that count, and that's really the relationship he wants to have with you. He came so he could have that relationship with you. The whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to reconcile us to the Father, because the Father's a good, good Father, and he wants to wrap his arms around you. He wants companionship with you. He wants relationship with you, and he wants intimacy with you. Now, Rob's uh, and the church are about to start a series on, on marriage. Marriage is an example of the relationship, the intimacy God wants with us as his church, with him as his bride. He wants that level of dependency, that level of intimacy with us, because he's a good, good father. I'll get back to the script. So Jesus is the, the image of, of the invisible God. His time on earth shows us what God was like. Because the Bible says that if you know the Father, if you know me, you know the Father. And we know a lot about Jesus, so we know the Father. Has anyone been watching the series The Chosen? I've done lots of crying in that series because for me, I identify the scriptures. It's good scripture. I can't fault it. And there's, in series three, there's a scene there. It's, it's part of the, 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 the cleanse series uh, part two where uh, Jarius, Jarius, is it Jarius? J Jarius, his daughter is dying and he just, he, and he's, uh, he's a leader, uh, leader in the Jewish uh, church. He manages archives and those sorts of things. And he goes and uh, he just goes with another priest and he goes searching for Jesus because he knows, he just believes that if, if Jesus was to come and meet this child and lay his hands on this child, this child would be healed, even though he'd never met Jesus. So he in the movie, he busts into the room where Jesus and the disciples and Mary Magdalene and others were, were sitting. And he, he just busts in and he says, you've got to come. And, and he says to Jesus, he, he comes up to Jesus and Jesus says, hello, Jarius. And Jarius says, hello. And, and Jarius says, I know you. And Jesus says to him, I said, well, you've only just met me. He says, no, I know you. And the reason he knows him is because he knows the Father and he sees the Father in him. And that's a very powerful scene in the, in, the, in the story. And I guarantee you, for each one of you that has an intimacy with God, when you meet God, Jesus, for the first time in heaven, you'll know him. It won't be like, oh, wow, that's what you look like. You'll know him. I'll be a wreck probably, crying and want to give him a hug and saying thank you very much. But, but I'll know him. It won't be like, oh... It won't be anything new. So God wants that intimacy with you here on earth like he will have with you in heaven. It's, it's your opportunity. Joshua, could you come up, please? I'm going to have Joshua read some scripture. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Yep, you just need to. Hello. Oh, it's on. Um, yeah. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's 
house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name. So the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. What's interesting about, or lots of things that are interesting about that chapter of Scripture, one of the things is that he he says that it's the Father working through him, the Son, on earth. It was the Father working through the Son, which is quite incredible. And if you know me, you know the Father. They're key points. And the reason that's also important in this modern world that we live in, where there's all sorts of distortions about who who the identity of Christ is, I'm here to tell you that he was the son of God. He is the son of God. He wasn't just a prophet and a nice guy that came. He came as the living God for your salvation and for all of humanity. He came to fulfill the prophecy. because Not just that he was a prophet, but he came to fulfill the prophecy as the living son of God, to be the holy sacrifice, to redeem us to God for all of eternity. Now, no Mormon, no Christadelphian, and no Jehovah's Witness will be able to like that. And I've got lots and lots of scripture to bury that for them. But he is the Son of God. And it's really important that you understand that and take that strongly. He is the Son of God, and he died for you, and he loves you. So I just want to raise that with you. I just think that's so important. As the way, Jesus is our path to the Father. As the truth, he is the reality of all God's promises As the life, he joins his divine life to ours, both now and eternally. Jesus is the truth, the only living way to the Father. Isn't that amazing? You've got to read the subnotes in your Bible. It's really good. These are really powerful scriptures. There's life in those scriptures. There's also life in speaking the scriptures out. That's the reason I had Joshua read that. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I want my kids to learn to speak God's word because that that word is living. So if you're reading God's word and speaking it aloud, there's power in God's word. It's powerful. Powerful over principalities and dominions that that will rule rule in this world. We can break them through speaking God's word out. Very powerful. Very exciting. Okay, we've just covered that. So in terms of God's character... This is a pretty scary topic to talk about because you realise if I stuff this up, it won't be Pastor Rob necessarily. He'll be upset with me. But this will be God himself that will have, a, have something to say to me if I, if I don't represent his character well. So I pray that I will do that well. Here's 20 things that I've observed about God's character in the scripture. The first thing is that he is faithful. He is faithful to those who love him. He is faithful. He's not going to let you down. He is true and he is faithful. He's a good father. He's forgiving. Now, it was wonderful to have that song this morning with the Lord's Prayer. You know, Jesus taught us that prayer because he, he, he knew that we needed to have a repentant heart. We needed to ask for forgiveness by the Father. If we didn't ask for forgiveness, the Father can't dwell where there's sin. He can't dwell. We distance ourselves with our own stupidity and our own carnal nature. It's only through repentance and forgiveness that we can receive intimacy with the Father. 
If you want God to dwell in this church, if you want to see God's presence in this church and see great miracles in our community, there's only one way you're going to do it. It won't be through great speakers, getting great guest speakers and a great music team. It'll be through repentant hearts that God will dwell amongst those that are repentant. And repentance and asking for forgiveness is not an event. It's a journey. It's a constant journey. You've got to get that right. It's a constant journey. We need to constantly ask for forgiveness. I was up at 4.30 this morning asking him for God's forgiveness for a few things. It's a constant thing. Don't think, oh, well, I did it once and I'm right. That's, that's not right. You're in a world that is carnal. You need to be constantly renewing your mind and getting God to renew your mind. He's forgiving. He is loving. You know, God is love. He created love. He is all about love and he loves you. He is kind. We need to be kind to others. And I know there are many kind people in this church. Kindness is a character of God and it's a character that we should exhibit more of. He is patient. Well, I can tell you at times I'm not very patient and haven't been. I'm getting better, but I'm not always patient. But God is patient. He's patient with his people. He's patient with you. He's self-controlled. Whoa, that's a tough one, isn't it? Particularly for us, you know, with a bit of drive and a bit of get up and go and, uh, you know, get a bit of a fire, a bit of Scottish blood in me, you know. Rah, you know, that's pretty hard to be self-controlled sometimes when you, you feel like losing it. But God is self-controlled. He contains himself. He's a good father. He's sincere and honest. He's sincere. He says what he means and he means what he says. He's always truthful. In fact, he is truth. His word speaks of truth, truth, eternal truth. He is wise. He has the wisdom that we need to live this life. He's understanding. He's able to understand all of your situations and all your needs. And all of your issues come to him. With all of your troubles come to him. Don't just segregate it and talk to him about what you think of the really big 10, top 10 items in your life. Talk to him about everything. Because he wants intimacy with you and he wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. He's selfless. And we see so much of that selflessness in Jesus, don't we? What an amazingly selfless person he was. Self-sacrificing. He laid down his life for us. He didn't need to go through that pain and being nailed on a cross. All the torture that happened beforehand, you know, with the whips and the, the lead things that were in that that whip thing that ripped the flesh out of the back of his back. He didn't have to go through any of that. He didn't deserve any of that. He could have commanded heaven's armies to blitz those soldiers. Absolutely, he could have done that. But he did that in a selfless manner because he needed to atone for our sins for eternal life because he's a good father. He's dependable. You know, we need to learn to trust him and lean on him because he is dependable. He won't let you down. People in this world will let you down, but God never will. He's creative. I mean, just go out and have a look at nature. Look at the human, human body. Look at the eye. Just study the eye for a bit and work out how it's put together. I remember going to my optometrist when I started needing glasses, just, just marveling at how the eye was put together and how, how the images are reversed and how the colours are reversed. And what we're seeing is very different than what was first brought into our, into our eye sockets. It's incredible. Such design, such detail. So if you've got a problem in your life that you need a creative solution for, talk to the creator. Because he's really good at fixing those problems. He's really good at creating new opportunities, new ways of thinking about things. He's thorough and he's diligent. Attention to details are important to him. And you can, see, you can see that actually in his creation. You know, if the moon was any further away from where it is from the earth, our gravitational pull would be such that our, the water wouldn't sit on the ground and when you dropped your, your coke, it wouldn't go to the ground and everything would float. It's very precise. The sun is exactly the right distance away so it doesn't burn us burn us all up, but gives us enough energy to create photosynthesis and create the cycles of the climates. It's exact. It's very, very exact. But it just happened with a big bang, right? Which is incredible. Absolutely incredible. He's also punctual. Now, we had some debate in our family about this one. One of our family members, who won't be named, thought that maybe 
God didn't need to be punctual because he was beyond time. He created time um, and therefore didn't need to turn up at any particular time. And I said, no, Joshua, we put that there for you. <laughs> because, because, yes, God is always on time, but maybe he wants you to be more on time. So he's gentle. He's a gentle God. He's a, he's a, he's, he has a beautiful way... When we're hurting, when we're really hurting, he has a beautiful way of connecting with us with his Holy Spirit that doesn't crush us, that builds us up and supports us. And that character of gentleness can be upon some members of this church to, to support those and others in need. That, that's a real character of God that I think many here have. He's tolerant. Well, thank God he's tolerant of me, eh? And Paul's be tolerant of some of you too. And he's compassionate. He's generous. Now, for all of those who aren't tithing, I've got to tell you, this is an opportunity for you to realize the fact that God is a generous God. You cannot outgive God in any way. So just dare yourself to try and be generous to him. And you just watch how generous he will be to you. I can guarantee you from personal, personal experience that you cannot outgive God. You cannot out be, give God in any way because he works in every dimension, not just in the one you're thinking about. And he is able to provide all your needs, more than above anything that you can imagine, because he's a good God. And he's always available. And that's just summarised in case the PowerPoint crashed, just so I had it. So I won't continue with that. So Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, Gabriel, could you come up and help us with that one? Working? But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you. Well, there's some, there's some characters that I need in my life. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What's interesting about that is that um, God's character is manifest through the fruits of his spirit. It's manifest through the fruits of his spirit. So the Holy, if through, so the Holy Spirit produces these kinds of fruits in our lives as the Holy Spirit dwells in us and flows through us. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we can get these gifts and skills, to, these characters to flow through us. But it's his manifestation through us that delivers it. Because he's a good father and because the Holy Spirit has, this is the personality of the Holy Spirit that achieves, this is the, the fruit of the character of the Holy Spirit. And these are good fruits, right? Don't you think? Yeah. They're good fruits. No one's going to argue about those. If you, if you could deliver some of those in your workplace, man, it's going to do some good things, isn't it? So these are the fruits of God's character and God's nature. That's really important to understand that it's God's nature and characteristics, God's nature and his character that's manifest through those fruits. And they, they're available for all of us and they're good. So Jesus' character was selfless, it was serving, and it was honouring. Now, one last point I wanted to, to, to raise just quickly as we, we conclude, and just particularly given that we're going to be focusing on marriage, Pastor Noel Portwine presented, uh, had a, ser a sermon many years ago at Living Waters, and it's, it's been pondering in my spirit for many years. And one of the things that he said, he emphasized this scripture this in Ephesians 5.25, now, the scriptures that precede this talk about other things that I don't want to emphasize today. They're important, but here's the point, guys. The point is that Christ's character was selfless. It was serving and it was honoring. And then, then it goes on to say that um, husbands, this means that you should love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Well, how did he love the church? He died for the church. He washed the feet of the church. He served the church. He was prepared to stand persecution. He was prepared to be completely selfless to ensure that the church was, was, uh, was reconciled excuse me, to the Father. 
So how much more should we? And I'm not saying I've got this right at all. This is a journey. I'm sure in the next month I'm going to get better at it. But this is the point, guys, that we need to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Amen? Because he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed and cleansed by God's word. This is what Jesus did for us. This is what Jesus did for us. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I hope you can study that this week and think about how you can love your wives more so that you can love them as Christ loved the church. Shall we stand and we'll just close in prayer. Lord, I just really want to thank you today for your word. I just pray that your word would be an encouragement and that you would be glorified in our lives. I pray that, Lord, your character is a good character. What we've learned today is how wonderful your character and nature is and how beautiful your fruits are, the fruits of your spirit, God. And I just pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, that we would serve you, that we would learn to get... We would learn to... Lord, that we would get closer to you and through getting closer to you, your character and your personality and your nature would rub off on us and that we would, rec we would recognize the goodness and wholeness of your word. I just pray that your blessing would be upon this church and this people. I just pray that you would ignite a hunger for your word. Lord, that there would be a passionate hunger to, to seek more of you in your living word. And God, you would cause us to be a repentant people that would seek your glory and see your provision, Lord, in this place. We just pray for our community, God, that you would just work through this church and other churches in this community, God, and change the lives of our people in our community, God. We just pray as we come closer to you that your character could flow through us and impact your community in Jesus' mighty name. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Thanks, Jamie. Hey, let me encourage you um, with that. God's a good father and he wants to connect with you. How about you head out, grab a tea or coffee, don't rush off, connect with one another, say hi to one another, engage with one another. And look forward to seeing you next week as we start our series, The New Rules of Love. It is going to be an epically good